Hi everyone, I'm Yuna from Chaos. Today we will explore how Chaos Scatter can help us create a MoGraph look and feel for our product scene. We will cover all the available scatter modes and learn how to distribute instances exactly as we want to. Now let's dive into the scene. I have a pair of sneakers and a few of wooden branches to complete the composition. In the background, there are a couple of lights to enhance and motivate the overall lighting. Let's now create our first scatter object. You will find Chaos Scatter in the top VRA menu. When you add it to the project, you will see the Object tab. Initially, nothing will be visible because Scatter requires us to specify the mesh we want to distribute on, as well as the objects we want to scatter onto that mesh. Similar to other C4D objects, we can use the Pipette tool to select the mesh or simply drag and drop it into the list. Keep in mind that we can include multiple objects here. In this case, I will only select the right shoe and move on to the next step. Now, I need to specify which objects I would like to have scattered onto the shoe. Let me quickly select all the vegetation assets for this scatter object and we can see how they will end up populating the shoe. And suddenly, we have covered the entire surface with vegetation. To make our instances even more clearly visible, I'll switch the viewport display mode. The default wire box mode is optimized for large scale scatters and it's ideal for such cases. However, for this scene, I'll switch to full mode. Keep in mind that the max instances value here affects only the viewport count of instances, not the actual number that are going to be rendered out. Now, let's return to the object tab and discuss the frequency values. In my case, I want some objects to appear more frequently than others. So, I will adjust their frequency accordingly with some values I have previously already tested out. Moving on to the config tab, we can choose from different scattering modes and we will explore these modes in more detail once we finish setting up this scatter object. If I activate the avoid collisions option, we will use the bounding boxes of the objects, minimizing or eliminating collisions based on the spacing value I set. Think of this as a built-in push-apart effector with its mode set to height. Now, let's explore the tabs that will significantly impact your setup. We will begin with the Surface Scattering tab. The default distribution mode is set to random, which you will likely use in most cases. However, we can also opt for the UV mode if you want to distribute instances using the pattern options below based on the UV map of the shoe mesh. The count value determines the exact number of instances we want to scatter. By default, it operates on an overall mode, but we can also set the density per area using the per square option. Keep in mind that the actual instance count is always limited by the maximum limit number as far as generating them goes. And it's also additionally limited, but this time only for the viewport by the max instances value. Right, the bottom two options of slope and altitude are quite powerful and I'll showcase them in a bit on a separate scatter object. For now, let's move on to the transformations tab. First up is the position or translation rollout. It provides starting and ending values for each of the three axes. This feature proves useful for subtle height variations, or in our case when instances fail to make proper contact with the source object. For that, I will slightly lower their starting position along the y-axis. Now, these values can also be mapped to a procedural texture, say a checkerboard pattern or a simple black and white texture. But remember, proper object UVs are crucial for predictable and art-directable results here. Next, the stepping option comes into play. If you set a value other than zero, it specifies an exact distance between instances, and the checkboxes below enable or disable stepping in the respective axis. As you can see, most of these options apply to rotation and scale as well. I will highlight the differences between them as we proceed, by default, we'll have a preset rotation randomness in our y-axis, which is mostly what we want, but I still would like to have a slight rotation variance in the other two axes as well. Next, 
let's explore the normal versus Y option. A powerful feature that allows us to decide whether our instances should follow the normal direction of the polygon they land on or always point straight upwards, regardless of the polygon's normal direction. In our case, I want them to conform to the curvature of the shoe, aligning with the surface normal direction. Hence, the default value of 0 suits our needs perfectly. A value of 1 would make them point directly upwards. Imagine a vast forest where you wouldn't want the trees pointing in all directions. Just as a side note, if you ever end up needing this for some artistic purposes, you can also invert the orientation of the instances, making them point downwards with a negative value. We could also preserve any initial rotation we have set on the assets we are instancing and force them to look into a specific object which can be very useful for specific looks. Now, let's proceed to the scale rollout. Initially, even though it's activated, we won't see any variation in the sizes of our instances. To introduce variation, we need to specify a range different from the default 100%. Typically, I would like to scale objects uniformly, which is the default behavior. However, with a simple click, we can enable per axis scaling. The unique setting in this section is the Preserve Model Scale checkbox. When enabled, it maintains the initial size of the instance model and then applies the scale randomization to it. OK, with the transformation randomizations done, let's see what we can do in the Areas tab. Both listers here expect a closed spline as an input. I've got a couple of spines already prepared so let's start adding them and explore what additional options we have. First, let me add a spline in the include list. This tells the scatter object that I want instances only within that area. Once dropped in, I gain control over the falloff using the near and far distance values. This allows me to extend or shrink the influence of this specific spline. The scale and density values affect the respective options of the instances inside that falloff area. So those are the ones in between the near and far distance values. Lastly, we can specify the projection axis of the spline. Typically, I draw the spines from the top view, so the default y-axis works well. However, if you have used one of the other side viewports to draw your spline, you can easily specify the proper axis afterwards. Now, moving to the exclusion list below, it offers identical options. I will drag in the splines I have prepared for this purpose. And the key difference here is that thanks to the opposite behavior, I can now start removing instances from specific areas. Alright, with this we have covered most of the important options for this particular scatter. Now let's delve into the slope and altitude options I mentioned earlier. I have another scatter object with nearly identical settings. And when I activate it, you'll notice a familiar starting point for our instances. Navigating straight to the Surface Scattering tab, I will scroll down to the Slope and Altitude rollouts. The purpose of this scatter is to populate the mostly flat front part of the shoe. Although the Slope option is activated, the range is too extensive for us to observe any results at all. And by gradually lowering the end angle, the instances will begin disappearing from the steeper parts of our shoe. The local up mode ensures that the slope aligns with the normals of the model and not just with the world y-axis. Lowering the angle to 20 produces the desired instances on the front part of the mesh. However, a few instances still remain on the higher parts which we will need to remove. This scenario is perfect for the altitude options. After enabling altitude, make sure you choose the coordinate space that is easier or most appropriate for your scene. In my case, the default local space will work just fine, but the range is too large. Starting with a relatively low value of 2, I can see the impact on my instances. So a value of 6 or 7 will effectively remove the unnecessary assets, retaining only those on the flat front part of the shoe. 
For scatter setups, with your higher density, I could utilize the falloff curve below for a smoother result and a more gradual transition. With this, we have now covered most of the options when it comes to using Chaos Scatter to distribute instances on a surface. Now, let's explore how we can use it with splines. I have a scatter object with some randomization values and everything else is at its default settings. Let's make the rock assets from Chaos Cosmos children of the scatter object and we can begin setting it up. I need to specify the splines I want to scatter onto. However, even when I do that, we can't see a visual update in the viewport. The reason for this is the default scattering mode in the config tab. I need to change it from 2D to 1D since I want to clone on splines and not meshes. And now instantly we see our assets being cloned onto the four splines. We also get a spline scattering tab instead of the surface scattering one. Here, I can specify the spacing between instances, and if they randomly move along the spline, that's control per instance using the jitter value. Additionally, I can move them all along the splines to achieve a more interesting distribution or create an engaging animation with the offset percentage. Lastly, the follow spline value determines the orientation of the instances. The default 100% aligns them along the tangent direction. I definitely want more instances for this scatter, so let me lower the spacing value to 0.1, making them 5 times denser. Next, let me go back to the config tab and enable the avoid collision option to space them out a bit. A value of 100 is definitely excessive. It practically eliminated out our additional instances, so let me gradually lower it until it looks just right somewhere around 10 or 12% seems optimal. Now let's switch to camera 3 and focus on the last scattering mode. Once again, the scatter object has randomizations applied to the scale and rotation of the instances, while everything else remains at the default values. I already populated the distribution and instances lists, and if I solo out just the volume I am scattering onto, you'll notice that it's nothing more than a funny looking squashed sphere. I'll set the mode from the config tab to 3D and now if I enable the scatter object, the instances are scattered inside the bounding box of our squashed sphere. This approach allows me easily to fill areas with instances that might not necessarily have surface to clone onto. I will reduce the instance scan to 100 and play around with different variations of the scattering pattern using the random seed value. And with this we have covered all three scattering modes, on surfaces, on splines and on volumes. Following the same approach, I have prepared a few more scatter objects. In this video, we went through the different ways we can create scatter objects using them with different assets and modes. We started with the default 2D on surfaces mode and explored the different options for randomizing and controlling the distribution of our instances. After that, we took a look at the 1D spline and 3D bounding box modes. I hope you found this tutorial useful and helpful. If you have any questions or suggestions for future topics you would like us to cover, don't hesitate to let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching this tutorial and we will see you in the next one.